Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's um, forum uh, about the connection of soil health and the health of our food. Um, it's brought to you by the Lake Oswego Sustainability Network, LOSN, and the Oswego Wa uh, Lake Watershed Council, L um, OLWC. Now, I'm Mary Ratcliffe, a founding member of LOSN, and I'll be managing this forum and running the back end technical side tonight. Um, we are excited that you will be able, you are able to join us tonight. Before I get into our intros, I just wanted to share a few housekeeping notes. So as you heard, uh, this call is being re recorded. All um, participants have been muted and please do stay mute unless you are asking a question. If you are joining by phone, you can mute and unmute your line by dialing star six seven. If you need technical assistance, please email me at mary at losn.org. Please note that we have limited, um, limited technical assistance during the call. Um, please enter questions for the speaker into the chat during the talk. After the talk, we will also take questions from the audience by raising your hand. Um, and we will be sending out the recording and any resources mentioned in the follow-up email to everyone who registered we'll be sharing the recording on our websites, both of our websites. All right. So let me give you a little bit of information about uh, LOSN. The, um, the Sustainability Network is a community-based nonprofit organization run by volunteers with the purpose of uh, promoting sustainability in Lake Oswego. The network includes businesses, community partnerships through individuals and nonprofit organizations, faith communities, educational institutions, and government entities, all committed to creating a community that values environmental quality, social equity, and economic vitality. We hold events, engage the community through outreach, and have multiple action teams. Some of our teams are a schools act, um, team, an interfaith team, a transportation team, a climate team, and a natural resources team. We work with partners throughout the city on projects to increase clean energy, reduce waste and toxics, promote clean water and air, reduce um, climate emissions, and more. Um, we help pass the city climate bill, um, plan. We have advocated for electric cars, switching to all electric homes and electric landscaping equipment. We help educate our communi uh, community through our newsletters and forums on sustainability topics such as sustainable building principles, affordable housing, alternative ener uh, renewable energy, and soil health. Soil is of a particular interest for us at LOSN because it is a significant part of the natural climate solutions. That is how we use nature to heal our earth. Healthy soil is a major tool in sequestering climate emissions. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to Stephanie Wagner, Chair of the Watershed Council, who will introduce our speaker after a brief description of the Watershed Council. Stephanie, you wanna go ahead? Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm really glad to see you here. Um, I was so excited that David was going to be um, able to speak to us today because he is, um, I just love his books. But let me tell you a little bit. The Watershed Council um, is a partner with the uh, Lake Oswego Sustainability Network. And we're the group that mainly works with, um, with restoration and uh, taking care of natural resources in our community. And we're also really involved in education and having people understand the complexities of our, our urban ecosystem and how all these parts work together. Um, and one of the emphasis that we've had um, has been on having people understand more of soil and how soil functions. So having David be a part of this, um, uh, what we're doing today, and you'll hear more about our kickoff for our Soil Your Undies campaign as we encourage our community to learn more about the soil and how it works in, in, um, in our community and, and how we can actually maximize the health of our soil, um, both to help our climate and then also um, in food and, and other aspects. So um, David is a, a, a MacArthur Fellow and professor of geomorphology at the University of Washington. He studies uh, landscape evolution and the effects of geological processes 
on ecological systems and human societies. An author of award-winning popular science books, he has been featured in TV and radio programs. His books have been translated into 10 languages. He lives in Seattle with his wife and co-author, Anne Buckley. Um, and their new book, uh, What Your Food Ate, How to Health Our Land and Reclaim Our Health, um, uh, comes out in May. May, right? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and I was first introduced to um, uh, David in his book, King of Fish, so, uh, which seems a little bit outside of the soil thing, but um, I'm thrilled that he's here to um, share his knowledge with us, and I'm sure everybody's going to really enjoy this. So thank you and welcome, David. Great. Well, uh, Stephanie, thank you very much for that. And King of Fish is actually the book that got me into writing books for, for non-scientists, for a general audience. Um, and it's not one you'd expect a geologist to write either, a book about fish. So coming to write about soil is maybe a little closer to geology. But um, let me uh, tell you what I'm going to try and do tonight, just to give you an, an overview on the work that Ann and I have been doing for the last oh, uh, almost 15 years now in sort of looking at um, how the way we treat our land and our soil affects human societies. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and, and hopefully what you're seeing now is a, um, a series of book covers. Um, and and if you want to contact us, uh, Ann or I, uh, 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 after the talk, uh, feel free to get a hold of us through our website or, or over Twitter. Um, and uh, basically, I'm a geologist by training, and that geomorphologist word that uh, describes what I do is somebody who studies the evolution of topography, how uh, forces shape the land. So, you know, 100 years ago, I might have been called a physical uh, geographer or a topographer. Um, but that's my, my real sort of training and the lens through which I see the world is looking at, you know, how natural forces shape the land and how that influences human societies and also how human societies end up influencing the land. So all those kinds of connections. And the book that got me into uh, thinking about the soil and the state of the world's soil is, is Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, the one on the left hand side of the screen now. And that's a book that looks at how the way people treated land in the past affected the fertility of their land and how that then went on to affect the, the course and fate of their descendants. Um, and that's a book that you might expect a geologist to, to write when it looks back through history. Uh, and it was a, a fun exercise for me in sort of learning about the effects of soil erosion and land degradation on human history. Uh, and it basically raised questions that started to be that and I started on a path was trying to answer when she and I wrote the hidden half of nature, uh, which looks at the way microbial ecosystems, the bacteria and fungi in the soil around plant roots and also in our gut are parallel systems that actually support the health of the host organism, whether it's the plant or whether it's the person. Um, and Growing a Revolution, the third book that we wrote uh, that has a soil-centric theme, uh, takes the lessons of history from dirt, the science behind the hidden half of nature, and looks at the question of, well, how could we actually use that science to address the problems that I wrote about in dirt? And then I'll tell you a little bit more about as we go on here. Um, and uh, that book looked at this how regenerative farming can actually bring life quite literally back to the land on productive profitable farms in the world today what your food ate the new book that's coming out actually in june uh is uh, the latest installment in this series that tries to look at the effects of what does regenerative agriculture mean for uh, potentially the health of the not only the health of the land but also for human health what is it about how we grow our food that influences what's in the food and how that can actually affect human health? So we've sort of gone from looking at how the way we treat the land affects the health of human societies over you know, centuries to millennia, to now looking at how the farming practices and the way that we grow our food affect what it could do in terms of its integration into our own bodies as pr potentially preventive medicine for helping to address some of the modern epidemics of chronic diseases. Um, that's essentially where we're going with what your food ate. So let me give you a bit of the backstory. I mean, since the glaciers melted off the poles at the end of the last ice age, uh, humanity has spent a lot of time agriculturally turning verdant lands into um, desertified or relatively uh, degraded lands. 
something like a third of the world's uh, agricultural land has already been degraded enough that it's been taken out of agricultural production uh, since agriculture started. And we're on track uh, over the course of this coming century uh, to basically lose about another third because the, the UN's global state of the soil assessment that was completed back in 2015 uh, concluded that humanity, the global us, is losing about a third of a percent of our global food production capacity each and every year to ongoing soil erosion and soil and land degradation. And that 0.3% number doesn't sound like a big number in any given year, but if you keep that up for 100 years, for the rest of this century, uh, it would add up to a, roughly another third of the world's agricultural land being degraded enough to the point that it's been taken out of production. That is obviously a troubling conclusion to come to when the human population is projected to rise by 50% over the same time frame. Um, and I'm not trying to argue that we're going to run out of soil uh, totally, but the problem is, is that we're, we're decreasing our supply of fertile land at a time when our population is rising at a global level. And what I looked at in the dirt book was to, to look at the lessons of history of what the, the, the experience of past societies could tell us and teach us about the moment in history we're at today at a global level in terms of the way that we treat our land. So this, um, DIRT was looking back at the effects of soil erosion and land deg degradation in past societies. And in researching that, you know, I did some traveling uh, that, um, and as a geologist, I've worked all over the world. And one of the patterns I've noticed was that in the landscapes that I was working in, often the most impoverished societies are that were in the areas where their, their land was the most degraded, their soil was most degraded. And I started to put the pieces of the connections together. And I looked back through the archaeological literature and the geological literature uh, for societies around the world and came away with the conclusion that soil erosion and degradation played a key role in the demise of many ancient civilizations from Neolithic Europe to classical Greece, Rome, the southern United States, Central America, and other societies that I wrote about in dirt. Um, and that's not a terribly original conclusion. You can find scholars who've made similar arguments all the way back to the classical Greek philosopher Plato. Um, but it's an argument that tends to be made and then forgotten, and then generations later it's made again. And so dirt was essentially my attempt to bring that issue back to the forefront of thinking uh, in terms of uh, how we treat our land going forward, in part because one of the lessons that I learned in that book, in researching that book, was that the, um, you know, it, if agricultural practices degrade our land to the extent that uh, it compromises our ability to raise crops, and we've done that in region after region around the world, what are the implications for a, a modern globally integrated society that really doesn't have any new places to go to should we degrade the land that we collectively have to feed ourselves with on this planet today? So. The question of soil erosion and its influence on past societies was the one that I really wrestled with in writing dirt. And I came to the conclusion that it was a bit different than what you'll find in most environmental history textbooks, where it's quite common to find the argument that deforestation or forest clearing led to erosion that helped to undermine societies. And I had done um, you know, a lot of work on clear cutting and landslides in my, in my um, geomorphological research. Uh, I knew a lot about the connections between you know, land use practices and erosion, but this conclusion I came to in looking at the story of society after society around the world that was that it wasn't so much the axe, but it was the plow that followed that contributed to the erosion and degradation of land that helped to undermine and undercut past civilizations. And what was it about the plow that uh, made such a big difference? Well, the invention of the plow fundamentally altered the balance between the rate of soil production and the rate of soil erosion on the lands that we use to, to grow our food. Uh, and that dramatically increased pace of soil erosion is something that is of concern if it's maintained for long enough, because the soil is like many other systems. It's actually formed, in the case of soil, it's formed from the breakdown of rocks and the integration of organic matter to make fertile soil. And, and fertile soil is really the combination of mineral matter you know, decaying or rotting rocks, as well as organic matter, the remains of once living organisms, and then the living organisms that populate the soil. Um, and what is it about the plow that actually accelerated soil erosion? Well, think about all the natural landscapes you may have seen in your, in your life, the grasslands and the forests of the world. Uh, not many of them have bare earth at the surface. Nature tends to clothe herself in plants. And there's compelling and fundamental reasons for that that I go into in the dirt book, but based, suffice it to say, that organic matter, the remains of the living organisms, help makes the soil 
fertile and productive to support the growth of more living organisms that when they die produce more organic matter it's a positive feedback um the plow fundamentally reversed that on the lands we use to grow our food uh, leading to the d decay of organic matter and the loss of topsoil how serious a problem has that been and what what's the pace that w which it has uh, occurred on that's a question I obviously wrestled with in writing dirt. Um, and you know, as a scientist, I wanted to ask uh, what we knew in the scientific literature of how fast are the world's uh, soils eroding off of farms. So I spent about a month in the library compiling data from farms around the world from some 1400 different studies uh, and came up with a, the, um, the number and shown in the red there on the screen that the world's farmlands, the world's conventionally tilled farmlands are eroding at an average of about a millimeter and a half a year. Now, that's a pretty slow pace by most normal ways to think about things. Your fingernails grow faster than that. Um, but a millimeter and a half a year is geologically a screamingly fast pace, because at that pace, it only takes 20 years to erode an inch of soil. How fast does it take nature to rebuild that inch of soil? Well, nature makes soil at a pace shown by that blue number at the bottom of the screen, about 2% two two of a millimeter a year. That's really slow. And at that pace, it would take nature, you know, about a thousand years to replace that inch of so that millimeter and a half of soil. Oh, I'm sorry, about a thousand years to replace an inch of soil that could be eroded off of conventional fields in just a couple decades. Therein lies the problem. We're eroding soil faster than it's being replaced, at, or at least faster than nature can replace it. Um, and that's a, a problem that has plagued society after society around the world. And with the numbers that I just shared with you, you can calculate for yourself how long you might anticipate that an agricultural civilization would be expected to stick around in a productive mode. Because a soil loss of that roughly a millimeter a year as a net loss, and that's being conservative, I could argue for 50% more than that based on the numbers I just showed you, but that, at that pace of a millimeter a year, it would take 500 to 1,000 years to erode off the typical half meter to one meter thick hillside soil. And it turns out that that thousand, roughly thousand year kind of time frame is approximately the lifespan of most major agricultural civilizations outside of the world's major river floodplains. And what are those major river floodplains? Well, those would be the places where you might be sitting there going, but Dave, what about you know, the long-standing agriculture in the, 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 the formerly fertile crescent of, of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers uh, in, the, in the Middle East? What about the Nile in Egypt or the Indus and the Brahmaputra in India or the big rivers of lowland China, where we know agriculture has been sustained and practiced for thousands of years, those places all share a particular geography. They're big river floodplains. And what happens on big river floodplains? Well, it's hidden right there in the name. They flood. And what do floods bring? Well, not just water. They also bring silt, sand, clay. They can replenish the soil that may have been eroded from topsoil erosion off of plowed fields. Um, but when you get to have uh, farming practices involving tillage that get outside of floodplains up onto hillside soils, it starts the clock ticking on the longevity of civilizations. That's the basic premise of the, or the basic conclusion really of the dirt book. And this slide here from Eastern Washington from the Palouse region in Washington from back in 1970 shows you why a geologist like myself would look at uh, tillage, the act of plowing as a very destructive event. And it's not so much the tillage itself, although that, that is destructive of, of organisms in the soil and accelerates the breakdown of soil organic matter, as I'll talk a little more about later. But tillage leaves the, bare, the ground bare and vulnerable to erosion by wind or rain. This is a freshly tilled field uh, that was then rained upon uh, in the Palouse. It's a um, part of what their, their traditional winter wheat fallow rotation was. And all those little channels that are carved into this landscape are the things that a geologist looks at and goes, wow, the soil is just bleeding off this landscape. What happens if that happens year after year after year in a regular um, fallow rotation when it rains occasionally? Uh, and this shows you the magnitude of, the, of what can actually happen. This is also from the Palouse in Eastern Washington. Uh, it's a ed edge of a farm field where the fence row over here is a fence that was built around a water cistern. So the farmer didn't want to plow over his water cistern. And so fence was built back in 1911 uh, and this cliff developed on the edge of the field where nothing happened between 1911 and 1961 other than it was regularly plowed um, in that uh, uh, winter wheat uh, um, fallow rotation. And it would rain at times, those rills would carry away some of the topsoil. Uh, and each pass of the plow would gradually push material downslope as well. How high a cliff was that that developed? Well, this little black bar here that runs from there to there 
is a one foot increment on a survey rod. On a stadia rod, that's a five foot cliff. Five feet of soil erosion in 50 years, that's about an inch a decade. Oh, that's about a foot a decade, sorry. It's about an inch a year. Um, there's nowhere on earth that soil forms that fast. Um, now, of course, I hope you're sitting there going, but Dave, isn't this like a really extreme example? And well, of course it is. That's why I like to use it. It makes the point I was trying to make. Um, so the question could be, well, you know, if this is one corner of one field in one state in the union, what about soil erosion over broader areas, the kind of landscape scale erosion I was writing about in dirt? Uh, this is an example uh, from the scientific literature, one of Bob Mead, uh, USGS scientist papers from uh, you know, a couple decades ago, where he uh, determined the amount of historical soil erosion on the Piedmont or hill country stretching from Virginia up here at the upper right to Alabama at the lower left. So not the coastal plains, not the rocky spine of the Appalachians, but in the in the in the once very fertile uh, upland country that was one of the original bread baskets of the early American colonies, some more than four inches of topsoil have been eroded off the whole thing in the last few hundred years, and in pl some places more than ten inches. How big a deal is that? There was only about six to twelve inches of rich black topsoil across this area to begin with when the earliest settlers started writing down their observations and recording in their diaries the nature and character of the of the region's soils. So if we could erode off virtually all the topsoil off of a region that was once one of the bread baskets of the early American colonies, imagine what the Greeks and Romans could have done at, with their landscape with the thousand year run at it. They could literally strip the topsoil off the entire landscape, which is essentially what happened in region after region around the world. Um, but the problem of soil degradation is not just one of loss of the soil itself. It's not just about soil erosion. The degradation of soil organic matter is the other dimension to soil degradation. And there's a paper published in the journal Sustainability back in 2015 that led to the conclusion that concluded that the soil organic matter content, and you can read that as the soil carbon content, because organic matter is roughly 50% carbon. It's actually about 40%, but if you think it's about roughly half carbon, you're kind of in the right ballpark. So the soil organic matter content of many soils in North America is only about half of the level present at the time when they were converted from forests or prairies to farmlands. In other words, if you squint your eyes and, and look across all of North America and think about it, we've basically burned through about 50% of the organic matter in the agricultural lands that we use to grow our food. What does that look like? It looks like converting this kind of soil into this kind of soil. This is an example from the Piedmont or Hill Country that in that gray noodle that I was just showing you from a tobacco plantation in North Carolina. This is the khaki soil that's been uh, farmed for roughly 100 years conventionally. Uh, the soil on the left is soil that was a farm, a colonial farm that's immediately next door. It's literally just across a fence, um, but it is a, uh, uh, on land that reverted to native forest about 100 and 150 years ago in the mid 19th century when that farm was abandoned because of the degraded soil and the inhabitants moved west like some of my ancestors did from the region. Um, and what happened is that the soil organic matter rebuilt over the course of a century to a century and a half. I have yet to meet a farmer that would rather be farming on this stuff than on this stuff. And what's the difference? Organic matter. The parent material is the same. They're both made, uh, develop, soils that are developed on you know, 10 million year old beach sand. And there's a reason, reason that the one on the right looks like California beach sand with some salty crust on it, because that's basically what it is. Uh, it's, it's geologically ancient beach sand that's been crusted up with salts from, from uh, fertilizers and evaporation within the soil. Uh, but the point being is that we've uh, basically converted soils that looked a lot like this into soils that look like this on a lot of the agricultural land, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, and that concludes the depressing part of the talk. Um, because uh, when I was writing dirt, uh, you know, it was easy to get depressed about how we, we, the royal we in terms of humanity, has treated our land around the world for, you know, the last 10 millennia. Uh, but I started asking the question of, is soil restoration possible? Could we actually reverse the historical pattern that I just walked you through describing? And I started to become an optimist on that in, in terms of answering that question in an unusual place for a geologist to do fieldwork. And that was in my, my own, in the garden in my own backyard. I had the good fortune to marry a biologist, Anne Buclay, who is a, um, also a very talented writer, uh, and we wrote The Hidden Half of Nature together that really looked at how she, it started from looking at how she was restoring fertility to our land, or our lot in urban North Seattle. Right at the time I was finishing writing Dirt, she had basically taken uh, a, uh, a yard that came with the house that we bought in, um, in North Seattle that had 
essentially what I like to call an old growth Seattle lawn, just six inches of tangled roots and, and monoculture grass on the side yard, which I actually thought was a nice place to you know, throw the tennis ball to, to play catch with the dog. Um, but Anne is a, was, is a gardener. This was a blank slate for her wanting to create the garden of her dreams. And so she, we pulled that lawn off and we found out that we didn't really have very good soil. We had dirt and we didn't think to actually dig a soil pit in our yard when we bought the house. We probably should have. Uh, we probably still would have bought the place anyway, but we had basically had fixer upper dirt uh, on the yard when we bought it. And this was not what a gardener really wanted for her dream garden. So Anne went on a, a crusade that we call her organic matter crusade, composting and mulching and trying to bring life back to the soil. And right as I was finishing writing dirt, we were starting to see big changes in our yard as she was starting to convert the soil we started with, the soil on the left here, into the soil we have now, the rich black soil on the right. It's the same parent material, the same yard, it's been through the same weather. What's the difference? How it's been treated by people. Um, intensive composting and mulching for, you know, at this point, it was about 10 years worth. We started to see the change in the color starting to go from khaki to darker brown within just a couple years. We then saw life come back to the yard in terms of uh, the progression of organisms that built up from the microbial life in the soil, which obviously we didn't see, but we then saw the ex uh, explosion of worms and then things that ate the worms, then things that ate the things that ate the worms, um, literally bringing life back to our land. And we realized as we started to uh, dive into trying to understand really what's going on with all the composting and mulching we were doing, it wasn't really us that was doing the heavy lifting. It was the bacteria and the fungi in the soil that were really taking that compost, um, uh, consuming it, metabolizing it um, there. And they were being eaten also by nematodes and protozoa and microarthropods. The whole soil food web, in other words, was taking that compost and mulch that we were adding to the surface of the soil. And, and we were kind of lazy gardeners in the sense that we weren't doing a lot of digging. Uh, we were basically laying stuff on the surface because we were both really super busy. Um, and over time, the biology took that material down into the soil and reprocessed it into materials that could support the growth of new plants. Uh, and that drove us into looking at a deep dive that became the hidden half of nature into looking at, well, how is that happening? What's happening around the zone, the zone around the roots of a plant, the zone known as the rhizosphere, literally Greek for zone around the roots of a plant, um, that is, functions as a biological bazaar. It's an incredibly rich and active zone of uh, where lots of life concentrates around the roots of plants. Uh, the, you know, the concentration of bacteria and fungi around the roots of a plant is generally way higher than it is out in the soil away from the roots of plants. And what's happening are those plants are, reducing, are releasing what are known as exudates into the soil. I, you know, I was trained in, in graduate school to think of the roots of plants as straws, things that took up water and nutrients from the soil uh, into plants uh, that put, took up minerals from the soil. Uh, but they're more than just straws. They're actually two-way superhighways uh, because there's stuff leaving the plant roots as, even as stuff is coming in. And those exudates, the materials the plants make and release through their roots, uh, are things like carbohydrates, things like proteins, things like lipids, fats. Uh, even plant growth promoting hormones. And when, when we found the scientific study that was, argue, that was demonstrating that plants were leaking out of their roots or exuding out of their roots, uh, plant growth promoting or uh, compounds that bacteria in the soil consumed, and then their metabolites, their waste products turned out to be plant growth promoting hormones that the plant would then take up that would support the growth of the plant we realize, oh, there's a symbiotic relationship going on here. Uh, and it turns out that those kind of symbiotic relationships are more the rule rather than the exception in the botanical world. And plants form those kind of partnerships, not only with bacteria in the soil, but also with fungi. What do fungi need? Fungi don't, can't photosynthesize. They, they exist by eating decaying matter or organic matter. But what they can do is they can ex they can exude acids that can and they can actually uh, collect minerals out of soil particles. And it turns out that many fungi form partnerships with plants where they will prospect for things like zinc or iron or phosphorus and trade them to plants for some of those exudates, uh, which is essentially food for the fungi. So these are mutually beneficial uh, symbiotic relationships that turn out to permeate the botanical world and that can get greatly disrupted by conventional agricultural practices involving tillage and lots of agrochemical use.
I'm not going to go too far down the road into sort of how that all works today, because I want to get to the, the new book and the connection to human health and soil health. Um, but the, writing The Hidden Half of Nature with Anne really set up the question of like, wow, okay, if we could restore soil in our yard in like 10 years, which recall from the numbers we were talking about earlier, nature takes you know centuries to millennia to rebuild that inch of soil. Anne was able to build six to eight inches of really rich soil in a decade. How does that work? Um, well, through those microbial partnerships that we were talking about, but could it work on full scale, commercially viable, profitable farms? Could we actually use the kind of science that we wrote about in the hidden half of nature to think about um, um, rebuilding the fertility of our agricultural lands? And it turns out that there's farmers out around the world who've been doing exactly that um, for years, it turns out, uh, that we're now are, are sort of could be swept under the rubric of regenerative farmers, farmers whose uh, farming practices can convert khaki soil like this into rich brown and black earth like that on the right. This is an example from Rattan Lal's experiments at The Ohio State University, uh, showing that farming practices involving composting and mulching and no-till can rebuild, can take degraded soil and rebuild its fertility. And as part of researching Growing a Revolution, I visited farmers around the world who had basically done to their farm what Anne did to our yard. And what I and I'll show you an example of a couple of those farmers in a minute. Uh, but I visited uh, Central Africa, uh, Central America, and across the American Midwest and up into Canada. Um, why didn't I go further around the world? Well, we ran out of money and budget to actually go other places. Um, and what I did find is that the, all the farmers that we visited who had been very successful at um, rebuilding the fertility of their land over the course of a decade or two, adopted uh, a combination of practices that are really followed the principles of what are known as conservation agriculture. And those three principles are the ones shown up on the screen, minimal or no disturbance of the land. So that means going no till, stop plowing, the, you know, give up, ditch the villain of that first book and dirt. And to maintain a permanent ground cover or to maintain cover crops in between one's crops in a rotation or sometimes even between the crops physically in the field, but to keep the ground covered with plants with living roots so that they're always exude exudates are always going out into the soil to support the community of life in the soil. And the diversity of crop rotations, not just growing one or two things all the time in the same fields, but really diversifying it up to have at least four or five different crops in a crop rotation or, or multiple crops in the field all at once. And why does this combination work to rebuild soil organic matter and soil fertility? Well, it's a recipe for cultivating the beneficial life in the soil. It's when all those little microbes are meant to represent around the screen. It's also roughly the opposite of what we've taught farmers or what what has been taught to farmers for the last century or so when conventional agriculture has promoted uh, conventional tillage um, with um, uh, with um, and and functional monocultures so essentially it's a very different set of principles upon which to build practices that could build uh, rebuild healthy fertile soils what I also found in this tour of farms around the world is that while those general principles actually worked uh, across the board, the specific practices that would need uh, that worked needed to be tailored to the specific setting of particular farms for, for the soil of a region, for the climate of the region, for the crops a farmer wanted to grow, uh, for the technology they had access to. So it's, it's not that there's a simple set of practices that would work everywhere in the world, but I think there's actually a set of principles that could work pretty well for, for rebuilding the health of the land. And I'll share with you the experience of just a couple of farmers here before I sort of get into what it means for what's actually in our food. Uh, this gentleman here outstanding in this field is uh, Dwayne Beck, who uh, used to run Dakota Lakes Research Farm at, at South Dakota State University. He was one of the early pioneers of going no-till in the region, and he gradually, uh, after adopting no-till practices as a way to conserve water, he started adding cover crops and complex rotations such that after a couple decades, he'd figured out a way to actually reduce their inputs, the use of diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide. Uh, by more than half relative to what the conventional farmers in the region were actually doing. And he was also able to move away from the conventional wheat fallow rotation so that the field, their fields are growing something every year, uh, every field growing something every year. And thereby, and, and the improvement in the soil quality was actually pretty astounding. Uh, but what really helped it catch on was the reduction in the expenses for diesel, fertilizer, and pesticide, which are three of the big expenses for farms in the region, as they are in many farms around the world. Uh, so their costs of production actually went down. But what about the other half of the equation? What happened to their yields? Uh, 
Well, that's a comparison down here at the bottom part of the slide. Their soybean yields went from 63 bushels an acre to 79. Corn went from 217 to 235. Once they adopted and got the system down that involved all three of these things, no-till, cover crops, complex rotations, their, their expenses went down and their yields went up. And as you might guess, that's a recipe for a more profitable farm because you're spending less to grow more and sell more. Uh, another, uh, another farmer I'll show you the experience with is sort of at the, uh, the very different end of the agronomic spectrum. His name is Kofi Boa. He uh, runs the Center for No-Till Research in Kumasi, Ghana in Central West, in West, Central West Africa. Um, and notice his hat, Got Dirt, Get Soil. Um, he, he's someone who thinks a lot like I do. <laughs> and I knew it when I first met him. Uh, I was really impressed with this farm and what he's done there. Because what he's done is he's, he's taught the villagers that he works with, how to go from their traditional slash and burn style of agriculture, which worked pretty well when you had a big forest that you could clear a small patch of in one year, uh, farm it for a couple years, and then abandon it back to the jungle to then clear another patch uh, to farm in subsequent years. But what happens when most of the jungle is gone and you're growing uh, crops on the same piece of land year after year? Slash and burn is a recipe for degrading the land in that, in that setting. He taught them how to move to no-till with cover crops. Uh, they get the diversity of their rotations by growing you know, many different crops in the same field at the same time. They're small scale hand labor uh, farms that can do that. Uh, what happened is that um, you know, erosion re got reduced by a factor of roughly 20 or so, if I'm doing the math right in my head. Um, so they shut off their soil loss problem. But what happened to their yields? Their corn yields went from a ton and a half per hectare to four and a half tons, they tripled. Their cowpea yield doubled from about 0.8 tons per hectare to one and a half. That kind of a yield boost was comparable to what happened in, with green revolution technology. Um, but the farmers that Kofi is working with are subsistence farmers that never benefited from the green revolution for a very simple reason. They don't have money to buy fertilizer. They don't have money to buy pesticides. They don't have money to buy patented seeds. Um, these are farmers whose primary asset is their little patch of land and their own labor. And Kofi taught them away by in, enhancing the health of their land by rebuilding the fertility of their soil to greatly increase to so increase their yields that it had a, a demonstrable and, and, and impressive effect on the economy of their villages. A um, uh, couple examples from North America. This is an example of the Cardington clay soil in Ohio from David Brandt's farm. He's a farmer who adopted these print. print, print practices of no-till cover crops and diversity starting back in the early 70s when he went no-till and over the course of about a decade and a half if i'm remembering right he added the the the, the cover crops and he, then he's now diversified his cover crops he sells corn wheat and soybeans into the north american commodity markets um and how does he he's actually very successful um, and a big part of it is that he's converted soil that started like this over here on the right into soil that's now like this on the left through the application of those three principles. Um, and it's his, you know, his expenses have gone down and his yields have gone up. He's, he's a profitable farmer uh, and he's literally restored life to the land. And the color difference between these is soil organic matter, which translates into soil carbon. One of the best ways ever invented to pull carbon from the atmosphere is photosynthesis. And farming in ways that turns this kind of soil into this kind of soil can put some of that carbon back in the ground where it does us some good rather than actually keeping it in the atmosphere where it's not doing us any good. Gabe Brown is another farmer who's done this on his ranch in North Dakota. This shows you the, his uh, soil on one of his uh, market garden plots on his, on his farm uh, and the neighbor's soil, uh, which is actually an organic farm that's, that's next door. Uh, Gabe's managed to increase the carbon content of his land to higher than that in the native prairie. And he's done it all the while with, through a you know, um, very, um, uh, through, through uh, a very intensive farming practices. He's growing a lot of food and enhancing the state of his land. And you don't have to just take my word for it as that uh, regener the style of regenerative agriculture that rebuilds the, the carbon content and health and fertility of the land is, is actually more profitable. This uh, graph shows you uh, 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 one of the figures from a study by Claire Lacan and Jonathan Lundgren, who uh, went out and compared uh, the total revenue and total expenses on conventional and regenerative corn uh, plant um, farm or on con conventional regenerative farms, in this case on fields that were growing corn the year he did it, 
Uh, and the way you read this graph is that the height of the top bar tells you how much they actually received in terms of revenue. And the colored part is how much they spent to get that revenue. So the white part on the bottom is what's left after that. So it's the profit. And you notice that the regenerative farms on average were a lot more profitable than the conventional farms. This is the kind of thing that started turning me into a real optimist on the issue of whether or not regenerative agriculture defined as uh, the style of agriculture that can build soil organic matter and build soil health uh, could actually start to catch on broadly across farming. And because if it's more profitable and it can actually, um, uh, you know, it has a prayer of catching on among farmers if that's their top priority. But there's also a lot of other benefits that come from rebuilding healthy soil, in addition to higher farmer profits. Um, if you get comparable yields from it, as the data that I was showing you and that, that I have seen in the farms that I visited that have had fully adopted these practices and kept at them for a while, um, is that we don't face a question between feeding the world and more healthy soils or more, a more healthy environment. They're actually complementary. Um, and why is that? Because these, these regenerative practices use less fertilizer, less pesticide, and less fossil fuel, all of which help on the environmental end of things, but they also help in terms of farm economics, because those are expensive inputs. And if you can get comparable yields with lower expenses, it's a recipe for a more profitable farm. But it can also increase soil carbon with all the sort of climate benefits that could flow from that, although it's controversial over how much carbon could actually be parked in the world's agricultural soils. Um, the, the, so there's certainly the answer certainly more than at present is a very reasonable answer. <laughs> um, it can also help with water retention, which can help with climate resilience for crops and also using less nitrogen fertilizer will cut down on offsite nitrogen pollution. So there's lots of healthy benefits that come from taking degraded land and turning it back into verdant land, and that we can do that through intensive farming practices is actually quite compelling and quite potentially quite revolutionary for agriculture. But what might it mean for human nutrition? That's what the topic that we tried to wrestle with in What's Your Food Ate, the new book that's coming out in June. Uh, and as part of that study, we basically not only, you know, looked back in the historical, um, uh, realm to tell stories about some of the interesting people who were had early insights into these kind of the connections between soil health and human health. But we also dug into the scientific literature to try and look at, well, what have peer reviewed studies found? And there's not much in the way of comparisons of soil health and nutrient density on regenerative farms versus conventional farms. So Anne and I partnered with Ray Archuleta and eventually Paul Brown and Jasmine Jordan to um, put together a preliminary study that looks at you know, the data that we could um, uh, pull together as part of this effort to try and assess what are the differences between uh, regenerative farms and conventional farms in terms of nutrient density in the crops that are produced. And part of the reason we did this is there was a sort of a, uh, a study that uh, a, a comparison that fell into our Anne and my lap when a wheat farmer down in Oregon near the near the near the gorge on the Columbia. Uh, had done an, a, an experiment where they had taken no-till or direct seeded uh, wheat and planted it in two, two fields side by side for a couple years running, one of which had uh, uh, diverse cover crops in it. And, and so it was sort of a, this uh, cover, so it was no-till cover crops and diversity of rotation. And one of which the neighboring field was sort of the, the conventional uh, wheat fallow rotation with, with a lot of glyphosate. Um, and what we did is we sampled the wheat that came off those fields and we looked at the mineral content of the wheat and what the column on the right is showing you is the ratio of the amount that was in the cover crop the more regenerative version versus the conventional version grown right next door all the green numbers are for the minerals that had higher concentrations in the regenerative um, uh, grown wheat and the red numbers are what was in uh, are where the regeneratively grown wheat had less of that mineral so look at the red numbers first less sodium less nickel less cadmium those are all things that you want less of in your food um, in terms of the green numbers there's more of things that are you know basic nutrients and also particularly of mineral micronutrients and i'll point out zinc in particular there's there's 50 percent more zinc in the in the cover cropped and uh the the diversely cover cropped wheat uh, this started us thinking about, well, okay, there may be some, are there systematic differences uh, in, the, the, in the, the mineral micronutrient content as well as vitamins, and it turns out we looked at phytochemicals as well. 
uh, in, in differences between regenerative and conventional farms. And so we did a pilot study where we found 10 pairs of neighboring regenerative and conventional farms around the country. And this is where Ray Archuleta's expertise came in because he knew farmers around the country who were regenerative farmers who'd been farming regeneratively for some time. And we sort of partnered them up with a, with a, a nearby or neighboring farm. Uh, in a similar with a similar soil and, the, and they had them grow out the same crop variety of either corn, soy, sorghum, peas, or cabbage, depending on what they wanted to grow. And then we looked at the ratios of things like uh, the soil organic matter over here on the left and soil health in the middle. Uh, and on the right, it just shows you the distribution of those ratios. So it's basically a plot that just shows you the range of values of soil organic matter for all those regenerative farms and all the conventional ones. And you'll notice that the regenerative ones had more soil organic matter than the conventional ones by roughly a factor of about one to two. Um, in terms of the soil health, which we measured with something that's called the Haney soil test, uh, which measures the, uh, uh, integrates not only soil organic matter, but also respiration of microbes. So it's looking at biological activity. The regenerative farms, again, stood out as different from the conventional ones as having healthier, more fertile soil, you know, roughly three times the whole soil health score on average. So it looked like these regenerative farms did increase the soil organic matter, at least in the top soil that we sampled in terms of the whole soil profile that we didn't measure that. We just looked at the top soil. Um, uh, and in terms of the um, and in terms of the soil life and soil health, it looked like the regenerative farms were also better. But what about in terms of the mineral density? Well, for the same these same soil, same crop comparisons of regenerative con to conventional farms, there are a number of elements that the regenerative ones had more of. And you know the results in terms of minerals were kind of all over the map. There were some where the regenerative ones had somewhat less than the conventional ones. And there are numbers where there were just, there was not much of a difference, you know, less than a 10% difference. But differences, you know, a 20% ish sort of difference in zinc and crops or um, in potassium or uh, and some larger differences in copper, those are substantial differences in when we're looking at the composition of what's in food crops. Uh, when we look at vitamins, uh, there were you know, four vitamins that we found sub uh, substantial differences in, uh, in terms of um, uh, phytochemicals, carotenoids, phenolics, and phytosterols are up to 20% you know, 20 ish differences. And what are phytochemicals? I'm sure most people have heard of vitamins. Phytochemicals are things like antioxidants, anti inflammatories, uh, things that are actually have demonstrated uh, connections to human health. Taking just polyphenols, for example. Uh, we know that certain foods tend to be rich in them, and what we're finding is that the regeneratively grown ones tend to be somewhat more rich in them. Uh, those are polyphenols are things that when we consume them, they go down into our gut, our gut microbiota, um, 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 metabolize them, and the metabolites they produce turn out to have anti-cancer, anti-diabetic, anti-inflammatory effects, uh, effects that help promote brain health. Um, they're compounds that the medical literature has connected to various aspects of human health. Um, another connection is that if we look at the fatty acid profile, uh, the fat profile of meat and dairy products that are grown, uh, uh, that are raised on regeneratively uh, grazed fields versus uh, um, from uh, livestock that are fed uh, conventionally raised grains, we find big differences in the omega-3 content. And omega-3 Fats tend to be fats that help suppress inflammation. Omega-6 fats tend, tend to be uh, fats that help uh, promote inflammation. And what we see is that the regeneratively grown uh, beef and pork, again, for a very small sample size comparison, but it's a preliminary result nonetheless, um, the regeneratively, regeneratively raised stuff, the light blue bars, tends to have more omega-3s than the conventionally raised uh, beef and pork that you know, purchased at a, from um, uh, conventional feedlot raised stuff. In terms of the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, again, the, convention, the regeneratively raised stuff has a much, much closer to a balance between omega-6s and 3s, which is what you want. The conventional stuff is overloaded with omega-6s. And there's very simple reasons for that that we go into in what your food ate, and it relates to whether a, uh, a, a, a ruminant is consuming either living plants uh, and leaves, the chloroplasts that are rich in omega-3s, or whether they're eating seeds like corn, soy uh, uh, based feeds uh, that are rich in omega-6s because seeds are rich in omega-6s. If you're really interested in the science behind all that, that's what, what your food ate goes into. And what we conclude from our literature review and the limited amount of testing we did to sort of do a bit of, a bit of ground truthing 
is that regenerative farming appears to be able to increase soil organic matter. It can lead to healthier soils. And, that you, and you get increased levels of, of phytochemicals, phenolics, phytosterols, and carotenoids in crops. And that certain vitamins and mineral micronutrients can be uh, higher in regeneratively raised crops, although it's highly variable. As you might imagine, the mineral content of soil reflects the local geology and other things. Um, and the omega-3 content of meat and dairy uh, raised regeneratively appears to be higher as well. So there's connections that one can draw when looking at the science between how healthy soil can actually promote the health of crops and farm animals and, that, and lead to uh, promoting the health of people. You can connect the dots with science sort of all along the way. Uh, of course, what affects any one of our, you know, the health of any one individual or a population at large depends not only on how we grow our food, but our genes and, and what we eat, our diet. You know, that's at least as important and probably more important than necessarily how we raise it. You know, if you just eat um, uh, potatoes, you're not going to be as healthy if you eat, eat a diverse diet with lots of, 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 veg, of other vegetables. Uh, so that's what we go through in terms of what your food aid is trying to look at what those connections are. Um, but I think we're poised today for what I like to think of as a fifth agricultural revolution, the one I wrote about in Growing a Revolution, one based on building soil health so that we can both not only feed the world, but adequately nourish the world. Um, so that's a bit of an overview for where we're at with um, where Ann and I have gotten to with our, our research and, and writing on, and our attempts to synthesize what's really known out in this and, and supportable in the scientific literature about how the way we treat our land affects not only our descendants and the state of the land, but how it actually shapes what's getting into our food and how that may um, affect the preventive medicine value of foods. Um, because those things, mineral micronutrients, um, omega-3 fats, and phytochemicals are all things that uh, the medical literature has related to uh, having the ability to help quell inflammation and inflammation is greatly at the is kind of at the root of a lot of the epidemic of modern chronic diseases so i'll basically stop there um whoops uh, and i should be able to stop sharing my screen um and i'm happy to engage with questions if people have them um but that that's sort of where we're at and how Ann and I have been spending my nights and weekend or our nights and weekends for the last decade or so. So um, do we have any questions? I'm, I have not seen anything in the chat. Anything have anything that people have for David? I was emailed a couple questions earlier before your talk. Um, so if you, um, the number one uh, one was, um, I'm interested in the full cost of accounting for cows and other ruminants on farms, net positive soil carbon health build and negative methane emissions, often overgrazing damage, tropical deforestation for cattle farming and human health costs of eating meat. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great question. There's a lot of interest in that uh, topic these days. And there's, um, uh, you know, the short answer is I think that you, you can find very, very big differences in the net environment, the net footprint of livestock, depending on how they're raised and particularly on whether they're grazed and grazed regeneratively or whether they're, they, you know, shipped off to a feedlot and fed a whole lot of corn. Uh, that's a very carbon footprint intensive. The latter, the feedlot model, is a, is a model for not only having a much higher carbon footprint, uh, but also for having a much higher omega-6 content in the meat and dairy products, which is not necessarily what you want. So uh, there's a lot of controversy about the sort of the net balance in terms of carbon for even regeneratively raised livestock. Um, th but the, there's some solid papers that look at uh, a greatly reduced carbon footprint from livestock on that's raised regeneratively. Um, I haven't done the full cost accounting on the farms that I've looked at for that. I can vouch for there being increases in soil organic matter content, but to really answer the full carbon cost accounting, you'd want to know the whole system. Um, but what I think I'm pr pretty happy with concluding at this point is that um, there are ways to use livestock and integrate them into ranching practices that can help rebuild the fertility of the land and put carbon in the ground. 
And many of those places where the land has already been degraded by overgrazing, you could reverse a lot of that. Um, and those are places where you'd be hard pressed to be growing a lot of crops because they're not good cropland, if they, especially in, um, uh, in areas that are semi-arid and lacking a lot of water. Um, and irrigation has a whole another uh, set of footprints. So the short answer in terms of, of, um, of, of, of cows is really, it matters a lot how, what they're fed and how they're raised uh, to, to their ultimate footprint. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a great answer. I really appreciate it. Um, so we have some questions about cover crops. Uh, one of them is um, how, if you don't turn over your cover crop um, in your home garden, how do you plant your food crops? Oh, uh, one way would be to essentially like, you know, cut off or mow off your cover crop and use it as mulch and then plant through the mulch. Okay. Um, okay. Um, some, some tilling is needed to plant crops. How deep? So in other words, just, it's not really tilling, but when you actually, to put seeds in the ground, you have to have a little bit of disturbance, right? Oh, yeah, and a little disturbance is not is not the end of the world. I think what what you want to do philosophically is to try and just minimize disturbance. So it's like it's hard to imagine, for example, like if you're growing a potato, how do you get it, or a carrot, how do you get it out of the ground without disturbing the ground? Well, the answer is you don't. Um, but the so what you'd want to do is to try and minimize that disturbance, and that's where wholesale tilling, where you're basically turning the whole soil over down, is really disturbing. Um, and so in a home garden. You've got a lot more. You've got a lot of flexibility. Uh, one of the things we did in the new book and what your food ate is we visited a couple no-till vegetable farms, uh, who are just have incredible soil, um, and but they're most they're small hand-operated farms, you know, lab, they're fairly labor-intensive farms. And you can do you can do it at a larger scale, but it's harder to do it at a larger scale with vegetables. But with with grains, it's easier. Okay, so I, I have another um, cover crop question here. For a Northwest um, home regenerative garden, how much mulch do you, which mulch do you like best? Compost, straw, leaves, etc. And when should you start to cover crop between the rows of what mix of seeds? That's very specific. Oh, I'm not going to give you a good answer on what mix of seeds. Anne would be the person to give you the better answer than that. She's the master gardener in our household. And I just do what I'm told on that level, um, but the um, or most of the time anyway. <laughs> um, the um, in in sorry, what was the first half of the question? It was just what 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 mulch do you like best? Oh, uh, yeah. straw leaves, etc. So I, I can give you a little insight into what Anne likes best uh, is that she uses a lot of leaf a lot of leaf mulch, and and she'll have buckets full of last year's leaves, sort of mulching away, and then put them out. Um, the and she uh so compost and compost and leaf mulch are the ones that we, we sort of use the most now she's also done uh the seattle zoo has a program where they give away the herbivore manure and that's incredible stuff um that's actually worked really well in the garden as well but for the most part she's basically using leaf mulch okay yeah with with what compost we produce out of the kitchen Okay, and then we had a question about, um, I'm mildly aware that farmers can order their seeds for what exactly they want to plant in the season. How much do advancements in cultivating these seeds factor into the results? So oh. in other words, are we, are we planting better seeds or is it better practices? Yeah, no, um, the, um... You know, if you look at the increases in yields over the last like 80 years, most of it's from crop breeding. Um, there's there's some that come, it's for breeding for crops that have actually done really well under nitrogen fertilizers, but you can breed for for performance and yield under organic practices as well. It just hasn't been per, pursued as much. Um, so I'm not sure I, I understand the whole context of the question, but the um, the um, the yield advances that we're seeing for the farmers that I was uh, showing the examples from, those were coming from the practices because they were using the same, like in Africa, they were using the same seeds they'd always used. Um, and they got big yield boosts from changing their practices go. 
uh, practices, but there have been big advances in yields from crop breeding. And one of the really interesting things is looking at some of the arguments for GMO crops in terms of yield uh, really go away when you look at the role of breeding as what's actually increased the yields. It wasn't the GMO part of it. It was actually the classical style crop breeding that they then uh, uh, inserted the GMO, uh, uh, the, the modified the genes. Modified, in. yeah. So. Sorry, it's, uh, been, a, it's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're just about done. Does anybody else have any questions that they want to share or ask? Oh, there, there's one other question that I see in the chat now about uh, the role of pesticides reducing mineral levels uh, because it kills earthworms. And the, the pesticides will also can uh, kill the mycorrhizal fungi that help partner and get minerals into crops. And the, the impacts of the nitrogen fertilizers, uh, overuse of nitrogen fertilizers and of pesticides on soil life, I think is a big uh, effect. And we go a lot into that in the new book and in what your food ate. Great. Okay, so thank you so much, David. And then part of what we've been doing with uh, Watershed Council is really having people look at our, even our gardening landscape practices, as well as just the food aspect to think about how do we support a really strong uh, urban ecosystem. So when our soils are a huge part of, of what that is. So I'm going to turn it over to Allie, who's going to tell a little bit about our Soil Your Undies initiative. And I know you're exhausted, David. If you want to leave now, you're welcome oh. to. So. Um, Stephanie, we have one person, Leslie Morgan, who's actually got her hand up. So I was going to let her go ahead and oh, um, ask her so question. No, it's it's hard to find it. <laughs> Hi, thanks for thanks. Um, I recently watched the documentary Kiss the Ground, which the big takeaway I got from that is the huge positive effect that could come um, from regenerating the soil in terms of how it can sequester carbon, huge thing for carbon, you, you know, for climate change. What are your thoughts? What do you know? Yeah, that, that's a great question. There, there's a lot of controversy around just how much carbon could be put back into the ground through agricultural practices. And there's, you know, frankly, there's been a lot of uh, over, over enthusiastic predictions of what could be done. Um, but that said, it's a, it's a potentially a huge amount of carbon that could go back in the ground. Um, there's roughly twice as much carbon in the world's soils as in the atmosphere. And, and you know if we've degraded if we've lost half the organic matter content from agricultural soils in the U.S. you know imagine putting that back in it's a big down payment uh, on the climate issue. Uh, I tried to wrestle with that in the the last few chapters of Growing a Revolution, and if I'm recalling what I came up with was sort of an intermediate level kind of a prediction that we might be able to offset up you know somewhere between a quarter a quarter ish of global fossil fuel emissions for up to like 80 years or so. Um, we're going to have to get off of fossil fuels to solve the climate problem. That's got to be, you know, issue number one. Um, but the soil can actually be one of those things that will help us get there. But it's not going to be this. It's not going to be the solution. It's going to be one of a mix, a, a, a potentially very significant piece of a mix of solutions. And my and there's a lot of arguments in the soil science community about just sort of how much you know could be done, and my basic attitude on it is that we ought to be doing as much as we can as fast as we can, um, and and not worry so much about arguing how much it should be. We should reframe our agricultural uh, um, policies and incentives to incentivize farmers to go this route as fast as possible, um, and I kind of view you know the the uh the biodiversity uh uh benefits the the farm profitability benefits and the uh the off-site pollution benefits and the potential human nutrition and health benefits that ought to be enough to motivate going full steam at this anyway and when you add the climate part to it even though it's not going to solve the climate problem you've just got an overwhelmingly i think compelling case for going full steam okay thanks we have an another question from eric klein uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, I just had one last question. Uh, as far as how these uh, changes impact the yields and I guess the variety of crops you can uh, you can grow, do you, 
is there also going to be like an impact on how the transportation or logistics of getting the food off the farms into say urban environments do you see any major impacts on how that will change uh with these new practices as well that, that's a great question um and you know if we were really to convert say iowa to growing more than corn and soybeans if you had five or six crops in the rotations you've got to find markets for those crops and then you've got to get them to people and people actually have to eat them to maintain the markets so yeah you're looking at i think some fundamental rethinking of sort of how the pieces of the food system all interconnect um and that's a whole end of it that's sort of the back end of it getting it off the farm and into people is stuff that Ann and i haven't really worked worked on but as you're suggesting there's implications for it in terms of how what we'd be growing and how we get that to what kind of markets right, thank you and i think that's it for now but stephanie i'll let you go ahead and um get ellie kicked up and david thank you this was really yeah. excellent yeah david. thank you so much david for your presentation i think we're very privileged to have you here and I'm looking forward to buying your new book. And I'm also now interested in the hidden half of nature um, in your partner's research that you mentioned. Um, I think that shifting in modern agricultural principles away from tillage and monocultures do have reflections in the work that we're trying to do within Lake Oswego and rebuilding um, the soil fertility in the land. And um, soil urundies was, at least according to the NRCS, invented by Oregon farmers as this sort of goofy, fun way to build uh, public interest in soil health. And um, so we adopted it as a community science activity because it, it's such an accessible and engaging way to track soil organic matter health. Um, all you do, really all you do is just bury a pair of clean cotton on these in your garden or your lawn or your uh, hygge culture mat, what have you. Um, and then take a soil sample and leave it for 60 days. And um, when you dig it up and uh, you return what's left of the undies um, to us along with that soil sample, we're able to take the percentage of weight loss, um, which we can compare to where you bury the undies. And we're also able to measure that soil sample for its carbon content. And um, all in all, it's a pretty efficient and engaging way of tracking and building soil health and getting a good read on um, how much carbon Lake Oswego soil is storing. Um, so yes, I want to I want to encourage you all to register um, for the Soil Your Undies Challenge and receive your free pair of undies from the Watershed Council. And um, we are having a in celebration of Earth Day. We're having a sustainability resource fair next um, next Sunday, the twenty fourth at Lake Ridge Middle School, which is in partnership with LOSN and the school district and um, some others. Um, and so we'll be there and you can pick up your soil, your undies materials from us and visit other folks who are also interested in sustainability and other um, related fields. And um, I, yeah, I think that's all for me. Do I need to mention anything else? No, I think that was great, Allie. Yeah, we just wanna thank um, David again for coming and telling us about this new book that he's written and all the research that you've done. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, I think that you know one of the things that we're looking at is our, each one of our um, homes has, if we have yards, we have habitat that we can actually be part of the solution and the soil and how we treat the soil is just a great big part of that piece. So. Thank you everyone for coming tonight and um, we're very glad to have you here. So, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.